with good will doing service as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good anyone does, he will receive the same from the Lord, whether he is a slave or free. And the other one is Hebrew, verse, chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. There's this uh, German professor who uh, decided to take his students at the university to the graveyard there in Germany that had all these, the cemetery had all these great composers of history. And as they were going from uh, gray site to gray site among the, all these great composers, all of a sudden music started coming up out of the ground. And the music was these great symphonies, but they're being played backwards. And then the professor said, oh, don't worry about that. I know what they're doing. They're decomposing. <laughs> you pray with me? <laughs> Lord Jesus, I pray that our faith never decomposes. I pray our faith never dies. And I pray, Lord, that our faith is alive, more than alive. I pray that it thrives, that it's on fire with enthusiasm for you. Lord, on this All Saints Day, I pray you help us take the scripture and make it come alive in our lives so that we're the living word. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, at Christmas time, we have the Christmas story. At Easter, we have the Easter story when it comes to the scriptures. On All Saints Day, churches around the world uh, have the same scripture. And it begins with, we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. Now, these first 13 verses here, uh, Paul is using, or the writer of Hebrews is using this imagery of athletics, a big stadium. These are people witnessing in a stadium looking at us. And we are on the playing field of life. So we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses on this field of life. Do, do you catch what the writer is saying here? He's saying, these people are not dead. They are alive. And if you read, again, from Matthew, from the word, Matthew chapter 22, verse 32, in which Jesus is answering the question, what about the resurrection of the dead? He says to the Sadducees, don't you remember what God said? In 32, he says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is the God not of the dead, but of the living. Jesus is saying, don't you remember that just as Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were alive years ago, they are still alive because God is the God of them now. And he's saying, wherever we are in history, God is alive, and our saints who've gone before us, our family and friends who've gone before us, are definitely alive, and we're surrounded by them. And we as a church, as a whole, believe that we are in the presence of them every single Sunday. They're alive, and that gives hope for us. That's the basic tenet of the Christian faith, that Jesus died, he rose, he ascended, and we can join him too. And they are alive with us now. The second thing he goes to in Hebrews is he goes on there. Since we're surrounded by this great cloud of witness, he says, lay aside every weight and every sin that clings so closely. Now, we all know what sin is. And we know how it kind of drags us down. Remember, this is an athletic event he's using it as an illustration. And so we don't want things to pull us down. Well, then what are the weights well, in athletics, if you've ever had an ankle weight or, or arm rate, or wrist weight, it's used to be resistance to help you grow stronger. Now, he's saying, now, lay aside these weights so you can run the weight race. Now, many scholars believe that the weight he's referring to here is that of grief. Because when people die, 
We are weighed down with grief. I know I have been. I've experienced being weighed down with grief. And we are weighed down with grief. And what he's saying here is, it's okay to grieve. I want to make sure you understand that it's okay to grieve. But don't let it weigh you down to where you can't run the race. Um, this is essentially what Paul is saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13, where he says, But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about those who have died, so that you may not grieve as others who have no hope. He's not saying don't grieve. He's saying when you grieve, go ahead and grieve, but know that there's hope. Because you know there's hope, you don't have to be weighed down like this is the end. There is no hope. There is hope. Um, when I was at Hillcrest, United Methodist Church in Nashville, I um, got a phone call one morning from a church member who was just upset because her son did not come home from the night before. And uh, she just knew in her gut that something was wrong. Just knew something had happened. She called the police. Of course, the police couldn't do anything. Adults are allowed to leave without notifying people. And so they had to wait a period of time before uh, it could be reported as a missing person. He asked, she asked me what I could do, and I said, well, I know one person. I grew up with John Carney over at New Providence. Uh, we used to play football together. He's now our district attorney. He used to work with Bill. And he, uh, he was, at that time, the head of the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation. So I called John, and John said, there's nothing we can do until there's obvious foul play. So for about three weeks, she kept calling, kept calling, kept calling for help from the police. Then one morning, she called me, and she said, you'll never believe this. And I had to check the door to make sure it was the case. The door was bolted shut. She said, I was sitting in my chair, and my son in his army fatigue jacket, he's about 40 years old at that time, comes through the door like Jesus when he appeared to the disciples, came through the door and stood at the door and said, Mom, I'm okay. You don't have to cry over me. I'm okay. And then he asked her, uh, if, I, if you had died and I was still living, would you want me to be sad all the time? He said, no. Well, I don't want you to be sad all the time. I'm okay. You can grieve for the loss, but I'm okay. And then all of a sudden, he just disappeared. That's when she checked the lock, and she said, I don't know if it really happened. I don't know if it's just my imagination, something I wanted, or just made up. I don't know. But in that experience, I know that my son is alive. And she was at peace. And so that weight was put aside. So we're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, and to lay aside these weights and sin, and then he says, let us run with perseverance. The race that was set before us, let's go and run. That is, in essence, live the purpose for which you were created. Live that purpose for which you, what is that purpose for which you were created? You've heard me say this so many times, I hope you remember it. There's no test. But Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, referring to God, God knew every single one of us before we were created, had a vision of what we were to be. He knew what we were to be. He knew, and he knows how we we're to be created. Those whom he foreknew, he also predestined, that is, had a plan. Every single one of us, a plan, a race to run. What is that plan? For those who foreknew, he also predestined, that is, have a plan, and that plan is to be conformed to the image of his Son, that we become like Christ in everything we say, we do, we think, we act, we feel, to grow into the image of Christ. Um, we are to fulfill the purposes for which we are created. So he's saying, we're surrounded by these witnesses. And we don't have to be weighed down by grief of what we've lost, but we're to go on forward and live the purpose for which we're created. Um, 
this, teen, this young lady told me that when she was a teenager, her parents, both her parents died in an accident. And she was very angry with God. And with that, her grades began to drop and all that. She um, has good enough grades to get into college. That first semester of college, like this time of the year, she wasn't going anywhere. And she wasn't doing all that great in college. But she, one night, woke up from a, in a cold sweat from a dream she had. And in that dream, she said, I don't know if I'm making it up or whatever. I don't know if it really happened, but it was real to me. So real, I have to believe it was real. She said, my parents appeared to me in the dream. And they said, you don't have to grieve anymore. We're okay. And then they said, if we had lived and you died, and you had a chance to come to us, wouldn't you tell us we want you to go on with life and be the person that God created you to be? And, and she said, yes. Well, that's what we want for you. Go live out your purpose. Go live it out. We'll be with you. And with that, the dream came to an end. That's when she woke up from cold sweat. And she said, at that point, I really got into my grades. I'm still trying to figure out my purpose in life. But... I'm no longer hold, held back by my anger towards God because I know my parents are fine and I know they are with me. And they are like fans in a stand cheering me on. Isn't that what fans do in a, in a stand, in a stadium? We're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. And we can put aside everything that holds us back and we can go forward. Where are we going forward to? He goes in verse 2, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. We grow into that image of Christ. We go towards Christ. And it makes all the difference in the world in what we say, what we do, how we live our lives. Um, last Sunday afternoon, uh, Glenn Abernathy, a friend of mine, started having bleeding on the brain. It just got intense. He died early Monday morning. Funeral is Friday afternoon. I went to the funeral. Now, Glenn... At age 55, retired. And upon retirement, he says, that's when my life really began. He, over the last 33 years, he literally has either built, remodeled, rebuilt 30 to 40 churches without ever being paid. He refused. Then, in addition to that, he went on at least 90 mission trips. We don't know the exact number because he refused to keep count. This is the result of family and friends trying to figure it all out. Because he said, every bit of this belongs to Christ and nobody else belongs to Jesus. Well, at the funeral, I, I remembered something. Now, one of his visions was the new Salem United Methodist Church building that they have. It's about 10 years old now. Um, I was pastor at Salem years ago, and, and Glenn told me several times that he had this vision of the church the way it looks now, because the old building was falling apart. But part of the vision was the stained glass window that's on the front. It's a tall, I mean, it's like from ceiling to almost the floor. Big, and, and this image of Jesus looks so warm and inviting. And if you drive by at night especially, it just looks awesome. Well, it, the thing he did not plan on, he never expected, it's a gift to the church. It's an unbelievable gift. When you go into the narthex of that church and you start to head into the sanctuary, the doors of the sanctuary are pure glass. They're not wooden doors. You can see through. You can see what's going on in the sanctuary as you stand in the narthex. But because they are glass, and behind you is the stained glass window. You can see the reflection of Jesus in the glass. And it appears as if Jesus is standing, hovering over the people. It's an amazing image. And you have the feeling that this is holy ground. And when you think about that image, it's like that's where Christ needs to be all the time. Hovering over us. Not just over us, but in us, through us, around us leading us and guiding us because 
He is leading us on into the kingdom of heaven, but he's leading us on with each other today. So there's hope. There is a lot of hope because God is the God of the living. That means we can grieve for that we've lost, but we don't have to grieve for them because they're alive. They're okay. We're the ones hurting. But we have hope. And they encourage us to go on. They cheer us on. They cheer us on as we head towards Christ. And we can be reunited to them again someday. Now we're going to pause and we're going to remember seven church members who've died since November 1st last year. And then we're going to everyone else who wants to share the name of somebody, you can share that name. And we're going to light a candle because these are candles of life. The, these people may have passed away, but their light still shines in us. God has loved us through them, and God will continue to love us through their memories and through their surrounding us, this great cloud of witnesses. Will you pray with me? Lord, as we are about to go into this experience of holy ground, of holy remembrance, of holy life that's eternal that you give, as we light these candles, Lord, we say a prayer. Thank you for them. Thank you for what you have done through them for us. And Lord, we pray that we also allow you to work through us as we grow into your image, as we encourage others. And we see these people again in the kingdom of heaven. As we pray in Christ's name, amen.